je, je m'appelle euh, Chikaya Luemba, euh, je, je viens de la République du, du Congo. Euh, dans, dans le cadre de, de cette thèse, je suis en train de, de concevoir euh, un séchoir solaire à pompe à chaleur et ce, ce choix va intégrer également un système de, de stockage d'énergie et le, le but en fait est de, de sécher les biomatériaux. Donc à travers euh, ma recherche, je vais non pas seulement euh, concevoir euh, le séchoir solaire à pompe à chaleur, mais je vais également porter une attention particulière sur euh, l'analyse économique pour euh, avoir un peu les conséquences euh, économiques. Et également, on va être aussi dans, on va également faire une, 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 une analyse du, du cycle de vie pour regarder les impacts environnementaux, qui, qui, qui sont en fait liés au, au cycle de vie du, du système qu'on qu va développer. Et on connaît qu'en Afrique actuellement, il y a pas mal de problèmes liés à l'énergie. Donc à travers ma science, j'aimerais contribuer à améliorer un peu le bien-être de la population. Mais je, je serai surtout dans mon domaine les, les énergies solaires. RCA a pensé qu'il est mieux en fait de former les doctorants qui vont euh, contribuer, faire décoller l'Afrique à travers la science. Et ça passe par euh, les axes euh, prioritaires des, des développements. Et c'est la vision qui m'a plu. Je veux vraiment, vraiment que ma communauté euh, sente que j'ai que je, que je fais la science, non pas seulement pour publier les, les, les articles, mais que, que ce que je fais en laboratoire puisse avoir un effet sur le, le, leur vie. Donc en gros, c'est ce qui me motive aussi. My name is Bethel Tarus. I'm from Kenya. Uh, I have a background in uh, industrial engineering and uh, in my study I'm focusing on the purification of salty water. There is a technology called capacitive deionization and uh, it was found that uh, the same technology can be applied in removal of ions from water uh, and in the end we end up with the fresh water. I have a big dream eh, that uh, eventually my research would significantly contribute to uh, the goal of uh, having fresh water accessible to many people, uh, both uh, for domestic use and industrial use. You know, as you are growing up, eh, especially in the village, you, there are many things that uh, motivate you eh, to help towards something. And uh, for me, my target was to become a policeman. I always performed very well in sciences. With my performance, I got that encouragement now to want to know more. In Africa, we now have uh, many opportunities for PhD studies, uh, especially scholarships. But uh, you'd find that the way RSIF is structured, they are structured in a way that uh, the scholar is uh, developed all round. The RSIF scholarship means a lot to me uh, because it has enabled me to uh, get the funding uh, for my study. Thank you. A very good morning to you, dear participants here in Morocco and those who are joining us online. Welcome to our day two of the RSIF Conference 2022, and uh, we are transmitting from Morocco. Um, for today's session, it's the fourth session. It's uh, Innovation and Green Growth for Sustainable Development. And uh, we will be led by our moderator for the session, and that is Professor Mustafa El Busini, who is a professor and a program lead of biodiversity and plant sciences here in uh, UM6P. And uh, I'll request him to start coming on stage while I say a few words about him. Um, he has started working here at UM6P in 
the year 2021 in the month of February as a professor of entomology and a program lead in the biodiversity and plant sciences. And he has won major awards, uh, the first prize of the Grand Prix Hassan II for invention and agronomic research category for advanced sciences and technology Morocco. And in 2018, he was awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award in Plant Resistance to Insects from the International Association of Plant Resistance to Insects. And in 2014, Distinguished Science Award for the International Branch of the Entomology Society of America. In 2014, he was also recognized as a distinguished alumnus for the Kansas State University Department of Entomology. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Professor Mustafa El Busini. A round of applause. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to moderate this uh, session today. Um, I hope you've been uh, enjoying the weather, which has been, I would say, unusually nice. And that's a good introduction to my our session, because usually in the month of June, July, August, it's quite warm in this, uh, in Belgrade, in this part of the Morocco. Now, uh, the session I'm moderating is titled Innovation and uh, Green Growth for Sustainable Development. So the keywords here are, of course, innovation, uh, green growth, uh, and sustainable development, of course. That's really the major uh, challenge how to uh, sustain uh, economic growth and development while at the same time conserving our natural resources, I mean the resources, or basically how can we keep natural resources providing the uh, economic, I mean the services, the uh, ecosystem services they used to, uh, they usually provide uh, to, to us. And there is no doubt that the, uh, of course, uh, industrial revolution in the last century or so has been somehow related to what's happening with our uh, uh, planet. Uh, and then you see a lot of uh, uh, changes uh, in the climate, a lot of variability. You see extremes uh, happening everywhere in the world. Morocco, by the way, was hit by a severe drought uh, this year, not only this year, but it's really occurring, you know, uh, every uh, few, basically every few years. And then of course you see flooding again happening in, this, in different parts of the world. So there has been, I would say, what I would call a, a disequilibrium that probably human has been part of uh, the causes of what's uh, really uh, happening. As I said, this is the challenge. So how really to sustain the growth, economic development, while at the same time maintaining uh, the, uh, I mean, the natural resources so that they can provide the ecosystem uh, services they usually provide uh, to us. And I was happy to hear that R uh, RS, RS, RSF uh, has three PhD students dealing with climate change, which is really good. So they are, uh, really tackling some of the, I would say, challenges of our uh, planet. That's good. Anyhow, uh, uh, so let me uh, straight go to our, we have a, a distinguished speakers, uh, Professor Lindsay Stranger from uh, UK, uh, from uh, uh, what they call it, University of York, and uh, she will be, uh, okay, just one sec. She's a professor in environment and development, Department of Environment and Geography, University of York. She has been the recipient of several uh, prestigious uh, awards. She has uh, authored several global environmental assessments such as the IPPC, IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Changes, I mean, uh, several uh, reports. Her research is on understanding links between environmental change and livelihood, science policy and environmental governance, and practical and policy actions that can advance sustainable 
development. And that's again addressing the uh, key word in our, uh, of our title of our session uh, today. So the way I'm going to run this session, so we'll have uh, two of our, uh, again, distinguished panelists to help us discuss this uh, uh, sex, uh, session. And uh, so, I mean, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Lindsay, Professor Lindsay will give the talk. Uh, she will have about 15 minutes or so. And then uh, we will not have uh, questions immediately. I'll, I'll ask our panelists uh, to, to, to come on, on the stage. And then we'll uh, discuss uh, the uh, session. At that time, I will introduce uh, probably the session, I mean, our panelists uh, later on. But uh, for the time being, let's uh, give the floor to our, uh, I hope she's. Uh, uh, Dr. Lindsay, are you online? Are you connected? I'm here, yes. Are you able to hear me okay? So, uh, while she's doing probably the uh, trying to connect, let me just introduce our uh, panel uh, members. And we'll have Dr. Uh, Quentin Delpich. Uh, he's a lead specialist for higher education and research uh, from the French Development Agency, Paris. Then we'll have uh, our second panelist, Professor Gulam, uh, chair of a passive consultative uh, advisory group. And then, uh, of course, uh, Dr. Gulam held several uh, positions, was the president of the International Association of Universities, a member of and vice chair of the Governance Council of the UN University. He is the recipient of several honorary doctorate and awards. So I hope uh, our uh, Professor Lancey is connected now. I'm here, yes. Are you able to hear me? Dr. Lancey. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we do. You Please. do hear me. Excellent. OK, well, I will share my screen and share my slides. And Ex Excellent, Professor Lancy. So please go ahead. You have about five 15 minutes or so. Thank you so much. OK, great. OK, so hopefully you are now able to, to see my slides. Thank you so much for inviting me to talk to you today about building centers of excellence in Africa to enhance research and innovation in the climate sciences. We're currently near, nearly at the end of the IPCC, the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's sixth assessment cycle, which has seen three new reports released since 2021 covering the physical science basis of, of climate change, impacts, adaptation and vulnerability and mitigation. And the warnings from scientists that we're seeing are the starkest yet. The quote that you can see on the slide is from the Working Group 2 report on adaptation. And it says the science is clear. Any further delay in concerted global action will miss a brief and rapidly closing window to secure a livable future. So now is the time when it comes to climate change. Now is the time for technology, for innovation, for research, for knowledge, and importantly, for action. Now, Africa has contributed among the least to greenhouse gas emissions, yet some of the continent's major development sectors have already experienced widespread loss and damage, including to biodiversity, water, food, and of course, economic growth. One estimate suggests that GDP per capita for the period 1991 to 2010 in Africa was on average 13.6% lower compared to a situation without climate change. Impacts are felt largely through losses in agriculture, as well as tourism, manufacturing and infrastructure. And whichever model projections you look at, the impacts are projected to become more widespread and severe increasing inequality, poverty, and loss of life. The African situation is particularly difficult because between 55 and 62% of the sub-Saharan workforce works in agriculture and 95%
of that cropland is rain fed. So Africans are disproportionately employed in climate exposed economic sectors. Another point is that climate change isn't the only thing going on. We saw some of the other challenges addressed in the short videos at the start, but Africa's population is growing quickly and rapidly urbanizing, creating other development challenges in relation to access to food, energy, water and education, healthcare and so on. And the IPCC found that growing informal settlements without basic services increase vulnerability to climate hazards. In particular, um, for women, for children and the elderly in rapidly expanding urban areas. And climate change is affecting migration too. Um, for some, migration offers an important adaptation. And most climate related migration observed currently is within countries in Africa or, or between neighboring countries rather than, than to far off places. Um, but urbanization has increased when rural livelihoods are, are negatively impacted by low rainfall. And this is expected to continue to happen. The, the data show us that 2.6 million new weather related displacements occurred in Sub-Saharan Africa in 2018 and 3.4 million in 2019. Now, even if we all stop emitting greenhouse gases everywhere in the world globally today, temperatures are still going to rise because there is a lag time between emissions and warming. So this means there's no escape from the need to adapt. It's becoming increasingly necessary and urgent. And it can be cost effective, but the adaptation funding flows to Africa is still 40 billion US dollars below the lowest adaptation cost estimates. So this is the, the challenge that we face. If we delve a bit deeper into the IPCC report, we can see that climate change also constrains Africa's knowledge economy. Climate related research in Africa faces severe data limitations, as well as inequities in funding and research leadership that together reduce adaptive capacity. Many countries lack regularly reporting weather stations and data is often limited. So production of salient information that can inform adaptation is lacking. Climate information services that meet local demands and are context specific, so maybe targeting agriculture or healthcare, are really needed to inform robust adaptations rather than people having to just muddle through. Africa also faces severe inequities in funding and research leadership too, which reduce adaptive capacity in the climate space. If we look at the period 1990 to 2019, research on Africa, Africa's climate, received just 3.8% of climate related research funding globally. And 78% of this funding went to EU and Northern American institutions with only 14.5% to African institutions. And similarly, the number of climate research publications with locally based authors are among the lowest globally. And if research is being led by external researchers, it may focus less on the local priorities within, within different African contexts. Another challenge is that to be able to adapt, people have to be aware of the issue in the first place. And work across 33 African countries shows that between 23 and 66% of people are aware of climate change with larger variation at subnational scales. So one example is from Nigeria where between five and 71% um, are aware of climate change among different states in Nigeria. So there's huge variability there. And climate change literacy increases with education level, but it's undermined by poverty and awareness rates are on average 12.8% lower for women than they are for men. As I said earlier though, it's not just about adaptation. There are other pressures too that affect the overall development trajectory across the continent. And one of the innovations in the latest IPCC report is a concept, an idea called res climate resilient development. And that involves bringing together actions around adaptation with those around mitigation and development concerns, making sure that as decisions are made and innovations are developed, that the trade-offs are properly assessed for each of the other aspects. 
It's basically a more joined up approach than countries have been pursuing up to now. It's joining the dots across adaptation, mitigation and development. To explain it a little bit more, um, depending on the choices made now at a global scale, we can either move towards higher levels of climate resilient development where well-being is high. This is the globe at the top of the screen. Uh, well-being is high, poverty, global warming and, and risks are low. Ecosystems are healthy and there are high levels of equity and justice. Alternatively, if poor decisions are made, we get locked into another pathway that takes us down to the, the globe at the bottom, heading towards vulnerability, high poverty, degraded ecosystems, inequality and injustice, high global warming levels and high risk. And obviously that's not the future that anybody wants. So to achieve these higher levels of climate resilient development, requires more of a systems approach and from a skills and education perspective that requires interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity so not just a focus on on science but also bringing that science together with the social sciences and economics and making sure we also tap into the vast amounts of local and indigenous knowledge that Africa has as this is exceptionally rich in terms of ecosystem specific knowledge to, to manage climate variability. Now this thing requires inviting everyone to the table. Climate resilient development has to be considered across government and all of civil society and should involve everyone with partnerships really being at the core. And to do this requires capacity building in, in what we often call soft skills, things like stakeholder engagement, conflict management and conflict resolution. Yeah, you think as scientists, maybe, you know, that's something that somebody else does, but to be able to make our science relevant to climate resilient development, we need to be engaging in these aspects as well. Because essentially, while we see climate change manifest in terms of its biophysical impacts and the destruction that it causes, its management is very much a human one, requiring, requiring investment in human capital across sectors. Now, the RSIF programme offers a huge opportunity to make a difference and to build climate resilience in Africa. But its effectiveness will depend on how it can harness those interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary approaches that I mentioned and match the necessary demand for particular skills with the supply of appropriately trained personnel. Capacity building is needed in inter and, inter and transdisciplinary working, but also in systems thinking and systems approaches that help students to, to be able to situate the kind of specialist training that they get during a PhD in their particular discipline within the bigger climate change and development landscape. Training needs to consider interlinkages, feedbacks, multiple sectors, scales and societal groups, identifying trade-offs and opportunities for synergy that come from innovations in research. Methods of trade-off analysis are rapidly developing and there is a chance for Africa to innovate and make a useful contribution in this space as well. And these kinds of skills I've mentioned in assessing trade-offs can help ensure that response options to climate change in one sector don't then go and create new risks in other sectors or simply shift the problem elsewhere. Because particularly, as I said, climate change is just one of the risks and the threats that Africa is having to deal with. There's also a need to develop skills in planning over multiple short, medium and long term timeframes if we're to avoid maladaptation, basically adaptations that make things worse, as well as getting ourselves locked into pathways that you then can't easily get out of, making sure that we're also building skills in critical thinking. These can all be incorporated into the curricula of multiple subject areas and are more broadly relevant beyond climate science too, enhancing overall employability so that PhD graduates from the programme are able to enter the workplace and help boost Africa's economy. After all, I think as well, it's important to mention that all jobs need to be climate resilient and green if they're to support the economy and green development. So there are no jobs that can't be green as, as we go forward under a climate change future. It's also important, I think, to highlight the opportunities to address, address gender inequalities through the RSAF programme, particularly in terms of climate science, but also other sectors where women are, are often underrepresented and, and where barriers to female participation 
aren't otherwise being addressed. So I think more awareness is needed of that and as well as proactive action to make sure that women are being engaged in, in the programme as far as possible. RSIF can benefit from thinking about not just the PhD process and the training requirements there, but also how students can take their learning forward within universities and research institutions in Africa. And this calls for a programme of lifelong learning and skills training on things like how to be a PhD supervisor, how to be a mentor when you're graduating from your PhD. And these, these aspects are often overlooked, but they're really necessary for African universities to be internationally competitive in the knowledge economy and for, for new PhD graduates to be able to advance up the career ladder. Another area of training might be in writing papers for publication in international journals, and this could be done locally or perhaps through partnerships with researchers in those countries that are currently dominating in, in the publication space. It comes back to this idea of partnerships throughout. I mentioned before that African researchers are underrepresented in climate science publications, but also on journal editorial boards. So that's something else to consider, getting involved in those kinds of opportunities. And in terms of future proofing, the impact of the RSAF programme, it's important that PhD findings aren't just in academic journals and, and that both students and staff are properly trained in science policy communications, as well as how to participate in global assessments like those of the IPCC. Now on the slide here is a photo from Colombia, and that was a different assessment. That was the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services Plenary in 2018. And at that time, I was part of the Africa Regional Assessment, where we're looking at the Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services Assessment for Africa. And the IP, I, IPBS have a Young Fellows Programme, and I was one of the mentors on that programme. So it was really great to see African scholars engaging in that. So making sure that these kinds of positions and opportunities are publicised so that RSIF scholars can, can harness these development and networking opportunities is really important. And finally, on global assessments, I, I have a bit of a plea on the institutional side as well. Um, it's a phenomenal amount of work for authors to identify all the latest research, to review it all um, and write these reports. And it's, it's not really possible to make a meaningful contribution without institutional support from universities. And that includes release from duties to free up time to con contribute. As I said, it's not just the time to attend IPCC meetings, but the time to read, to digest what we're reading, to actually make the assessment and to write. And that's you know, that balance, we haven't got that right in the UK yet either. In terms of further institutional aspects, the statistics I took from the IPCC report um, and mentioned earlier regarding research funding demonstrate that African universities need more direct control over research design and resources to provide more actionable insights on climate risks and adaptation options. Also at an institutional level, universities need to lead on tackling climate change and delivering for public good. Politicians are too slow. We can't just leave it to the politicians. We, we need to be acting from the bottom upwards. And, and universities are great role models. They need to be walking the talk, as we say, rapidly transitioning into being models of climate resilience, using the research findings and knowledge that they're generating um, and putting it into practice, actioning those joined up approaches, both on campus and okay. in, in the local area. So I'll finish with consideration of, of the types of mechanisms needed to move beyond building human capital through skills training support to support capacity building and networking. And again, this is something we're just starting to do in York as well. And that's to make better use of existing relationships to support growth and knowledge sharing. African universities have large, huge numbers of alumni who go on to work in industry policy and so on. So utilizing those networks to support industrial placements, policy secondments and so on can form a really useful part of the PhD training, but also the host institutions, the host organizations benefit as the students bring the latest knowledge that they might not otherwise be aware of. In turn, this can reinforce 
science into policy links and inform evidence-based decision-making to support adaptation and climate resilient development. There's a need to get out into the field as well and to engage more with society in general, moving beyond that ivory tower of academia and getting out into the real world. Engaging with stakeholders around climate issues is a really useful way to practice and further negotiation and listening skills and support learning, as well as being able to, to tap into that vast reservoir of indigenous and local knowledge that I mentioned earlier. Overall, and, and combining these points um, can have a real impact and build climate leadership. And, and this leads me to wrap up with some questions which I'm not expecting answers to necessarily, but which I hope highlights some opportunities to think about. It's clear that the programme you have here can benefit Africa immensely and, and with the appropriate skills development, training and institutional support can build Africa's climate leadership. But what does this mean for the knowledge economy and climate change beyond Africa? How can the UK and other countries learn from you? And how can or how should we be adapting our approaches in, in Europe and, and elsewhere as part of the promotion and the globalization of African climate leadership? And I think that building research partnerships that can help deliver that potential is going to be really, really central um, moving forward, both across the continent and externally as well. And I'll wrap up by saying that certainly at the University of York, where I'm based, the door is always open for discussions, for collaboration and for learning. So, so do reach out if anything I've said is, is resonating with you and, and you want to build those, those partnerships and, and collaborative links. So I'll, I'll stop there and just acknowledge um, many of my colleagues who I had useful discussions with um, to help inform this talk as I was preparing my slides. So I hope I haven't rambled on too much and thank you once again for, for inviting me to, to give this presentation today. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Lancey, uh, for this. So <clears throat> thank you so much. <clears throat> Professor Lencia for this uh, wonderful presentation, taking us uh, through, I mean, basically the whole, uh, the process of uh, what's happening in terms of climate change mainly in Africa. And then also what needs to be done uh, in terms of really uh, capacity building, uh, building uh, leader, future leaders really to deal with climate change. Uh, I think I really liked your system approach is, you know, people should really learn. I mean, they should not do it uh, in silos, but they should really work in uh, get into the system approach and partnership. So these are the key, I would say, word that I, I got from your uh, uh, system approach and then uh, leadership, I mean, uh, partnership. So let me call on uh, Professor Ghulam. So I don't think we'll open the question here. We'll open the question afterward. Let me call on Professor Ghulam and then uh, our colleague from uh, France, uh, Dr. Quentin. I hope mm -hmm. he's online. Oui, c'est bon, je suis en ligne. Good, excellent. <clears throat> I, oh, you can just take the microphone if you want. Yeah. Uh, let me, let me ask. okay. So, uh, Dr. Ghulam, uh, okay. Um, Professor Dr. Ram, you were the president of the International Association of Universities and member of and vice chair of the Government Council of the UN Universities. So how do you think universities and institutions in general are responding to this uh, climate change challenges, basically? Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, uh, good morning to every one of you. Good afternoon, wherever you may be. Uh, I think the message from Professor Stringer is very clear. Action is needed, and action is needed by one and all. 
to be able to solve, at least to mitigate the impact of, uh, of climate change. Professor Stringer has already uh, given some indication. I mean, she talked very globally, generally, and region-wise, but also she included uh, some aspects of how universities can approach the issues of climate change. And that's the aspect that I would like to uh, complement her talk uh, on uh, as far as climate change is concerned. The role of universities, the role of institutions in mitigating uh, climate change. Um, about a decade ago, African universities played little attention to climate change. In most cases, the emphasis was an environment. It was the 2015 Sustainable Development Goals, in particular Goal 13, which you all know on climate action, that really aroused their interest in uh, to start climate change education. However, they faced two major challenges, lack of funding and lack of expertise in climate change. With external and donor funding, several universities started initially master's programs in climate change. The University of Cape Town in South Africa was one of the leaders in this initiative. PhD programs were subsequently launched, the motive being generating research relevant to Africa and capacity building of academic staff. Then came the creation of centers of excellence in climate change. Again, initiated through external funding. The idea being to undertake postgraduate teaching and research and to near network, form partnership with other institutions. There are many examples of such centers and allow me just to mention three of them. The first one is the World Bank supported African Center of Excellence, ACE, for Climate Smart Agriculture and Biodiversity Conservation at Haramaya University in Ethiopia. And we have the president and vice chancellor of that university participating in this uh, conference. The second one is the African Research Universities Alliance, ARUA, Center of Excellence in Climate Change and Development, which is really a network of three universities, University of Cape Town, University of Nairobi, and University of Ghana. And the third example is Waskal in West Africa and Saskal in Southern Africa, funded by German DAD to enable pooling of expertise and resources in climate change of a number of universities in several countries in the respective region with the participation of German universities. While the Center of Excellence initiatives so far are commendable and uh, good progress has been made, what universities have to embark upon now is to mainstream climate change in all university programs so that graduates in any field can help to mitigate the impact of climate change wherever they are employed after leaving the university. This to some extent has already been started in some subjects such as agriculture, engineering, architecture, economics and so on but covering the less obvious areas may prove to be a challenge. One of the critical areas to, uh, to, to deal with is teacher education in faculties of education, as it is important to train teachers to sensitize students in schools about climate change before they come to university. One main challenge to mainstreaming climate change in university program, already mentioned by Professor Stringer, is that it requires a multi and transdisciplinary approach, which academic staff are often reluctant to adopt, partly because they have not been trained that way, and partly because they prefer to remain within their specialized field with regard to research and publication. Besides teaching and research, African universities can make an important contribution and impact on climate change by reaching out to the community and to society. They could then disseminate climate change information and engage communities on mitigation and adaptation measures through non-formal and informal education. This also provides an opportunity for universities to explore the application of some of their innovations and research findings. And as importantly, this would help them to tap into valuable indigenous knowledge on climate change from the communities. In the same vein, universities could reach out to policymakers to assist in formul formulating policy 
and providing adv ad advice on climate change mitigation issues. Let me end by saying that because of the importance of climate change, not only for Africa, but equally for the whole world, African need, universities need to establish an institutional strategy on climate change. Perhaps one way of achieving this is for each university to create a dedicated center to coordinate and promote all climate change activities on the campus. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Olam. And then, of course, I would uh, uh, the best summary that out of your you know, talk was really to institutionalize the climate change uh, basically in every university so that we build capacity building around this uh, major uh, challenge. Now I'll give the floor to uh, uh, Dr. Quentin from France, and then he will tell us how, what is the strategy of the French agency uh, for development uh, in relation to really climate change challenges and then uh, green growth, etc. And then uh, let me just remind you that we don't have a lot of time. So probably if you take five minutes so that you can leave a little bit of time for questions, exponentielle depuis plus d'un siècle, le dérèglement climatique et écologique est l'un des grands défis des sociétés aux quatre coins du monde. Les acteurs de l'enseignement supérieur et la recherche contribuent à fournir des réponses concrètes à travers différents leviers. Formés et sensibilisés aux compétences du 21e siècle. De nombreux métiers vont se transformer, d'autres émerger et d'autres encore disparaître. Les institutions d'enseignement supérieur s'adaptent pour rénover leur pédagogie ainsi que leur filière de formation ou en créer de nouvelles. Elles soutiennent la demande de la jeunesse pour sensibiliser davantage au changement climatique et à la préservation de l'environnement. Produire et partager les savoirs, faire émerger des solutions innovantes. La recherche scientifique a un rôle clé à jouer dans la production et la diffusion des savoirs. Pour mieux connaître et comprendre les enjeux climatiques et environnementaux, elle peut aussi y apporter des réponses en permettant la mise au point d'innovations durables dans de nombreux secteurs comme l'énergie, la sécurité alimentaire, la santé, etc. Devenir une vitrine d'un futur durable à travers des campus sobres et résilients face au changement climatique. À travers des campus durables, avec une gestion responsable des modes de transport, des déchets, de l'eau et de l'électricité, et des conceptions d'infrastructures sobres et adaptées aux évolutions du changement climatique. L'AFD soutient l'engagement des acteurs de l'enseignement supérieur dans leur choix de politique publique. Au Sénégal, avec la facilité Adapt Action, l'AFD appuie l'intégration des enjeux relatifs au climat, notamment l'adaptation au changement climatique au sein du système éducatif. Leur rôle d'anticipation et d'innovation. Au Nigeria, en Côte d'Ivoire, au Bénin, l'AFD finance des centres d'excellence pour former au métier de la transition et développer des recherches appliquées sur les enjeux de la biodiversité, du changement climatique, de l'agriculture durable, des énergies nouvelles. Leur rôle de catalyseur et d'exemplarité. Au Nigeria, au Kenya, en Côte d'Ivoire encore, l'AFD accompagne les universités et les bailleurs sociaux de logements étudiants afin que les programmes d'infrastructure anticipent les conséquences du changement climatique et valorisent des solutions responsables. Bonjour à tous. Je ne sais pas si on, on peut m'entendre. Je vous remercie. Je, donc c'était une petite. Je sais, on peut m'entendre, c'est ok Allô Are you with us Vous m'entendez Oui, oui, oui. Oui. Ok, donc euh, merci à tous, merci aux organisateurs. Donc c'était une, une, une vidéo en fait pour présenter euh, euh, l'action de l'AFD euh, sur euh, sur le lien entre l'enseignement supérieur et, et les enjeux d'atténuation et d'adaptation au, au changement climatique. Euh, je vais donner une, une petite présentation, mais je veux préciser euh, que je suis donc je travaille pour l'Agence française de développement, donc je suis du côté des, des financeurs. Donc je suis pas un spécialiste des sciences du climat. Euh, donc c'est la, la présentation que je vais donner, elle est plutôt une vision euh, des bailleurs et des financeurs euh, du développement. Donc, si on peut aller sur, sur la slide suivante. Next slide, please. So, uh... donc, là, donc, quelques chiffres juste pour l'AFD. L'AFD euh, s'est engagée à, à être une banque de développement qui est 100% 
euh, en accord avec accord de, les accords de Paris et donc euh, à la fois sur les objectifs climat et les objectifs biodiversité. Euh, le groupe AFD a, a octroyé, s'est engagé euh, l'an dernier à plus de, de 6 milliards de, de financements pour lutter contre le changement climatique et ses effets. Et dans ce cadre-là, l'éducation est un aspect essentiel de l'intervention de, de l'Agence française de développement. Euh, ça passe à la fois par des financements donc, sur euh, l'adaptation, donc 2 milliards de financements de, sur les projets euh, pour l'adaptation au changement climatique et 4 milliards euh, sur les aspects euh, atténuation euh, du changement climatique. On voit que ça concerne l'ensemble des secteurs d'intervention, l'agriculture, les infrastructures, le transport, l'énergie, et mais aussi des interventions spécifiquement sur les questions euh, d'enseignement d'éducation de base, de formation professionnelle, d'enseignement, donc sur l'ensemble du continuum éducatif. Euh, sur la slide suivante, s'il vous plaît. Donc, l'Agence française de développement, en fait, cofinance avec la Banque mondiale le programme qui a déjà été évoqué par le, le précédent euh, intervenant, donc les centres d'excellence africains, euh, à la fois donc, dans la zone euh, Afrique euh, Sahel, Afrique centrale, Afrique de l'Ouest et aussi dans l'Afrique australe et Afrique de l'Est. Et donc, il y a beaucoup de, de, de résultats qui ont été atteints par les centres et notamment les centres qui sont dédiés aux, aux problématiques de climat sur l'agriculture, sur la gestion de l'eau, sur la dégradation côtière, sur la biodiversité. Ces centres ont déjà donc des, des résultats très significatifs, notamment en termes d'augmentation du nombre de, 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 de publications scientifiques et de développement de capacités nationales sur ces thématiques particulières. Donc ça, c'est des premiers acquis. Donc dans le programme, il y a plus de 3500 euh, publications scientifiques qui ont été réalisées par les centres d'excellence et euh, à peu près 2800, un peu moins de 3000 euh, doctorants qui, qui ont été recrutés et formés dans le cadre du programme. Il y a aussi un, un lien beaucoup plus fort avec le secteur euh, privé euh, dans la prise en compte donc, de la demande des, des acteurs économiques euh, et le lien qui est fait avec une recherche véritablement partenariale. Et là, on a à peu près dans le programme euh, plus de 80 millions de dollars qui ont été levés par les centres directement dans le cadre de formations spécifiques sur mesure réalisées par les centres pour le secteur privé ou euh, pour réaliser des, des, des collaborations de, de, de recherche soit avec le secteur privé, soit avec les décideurs publics, soit avec des fondations, par exemple. Donc ça, c'est des, des acquis, mais il y a beaucoup donc, de, de, de défis qui restent pour ces centres d'excellence à, à relever. La question de, de la qualité de l'éducation et de la recherche qui est réalisée, ce qu'on ce qu constate, c'est que les, les, les modalités de, de réalisation de la recherche, de, des enseignements, n'ont pas été tout à fait renouvelé dans les pédagogies, dans les manières d'enseigner. Et donc, l'accès notamment aux accréditations régionales et internationales sont encore relativement euh, limitées, mais c'est quelque chose qui est en train d'être réalisé par, par les centres d'excellence. Ça a été évoqué aussi l'importance de, de valoriser euh, euh, le lien avec euh, la communauté et puis la société en général, donc de valoriser euh, la recherche et un certain nombre d'efforts de, qui sont à faire par les centres. Euh, donc, c'est ce qu'évoquait le professeur. Euh, le stringer, le fait de, de sortir de cette, un peu de cette tour d'ivoire et d'avoir vraiment un impact sur la société, ça passe par faire différemment de la recherche, ou en tout cas la valoriser différemment auprès de, de la société. Et l'aspect du networking, donc ça a été évoqué par les deux, euh, les deux euh, intervenants précédents. Un des enjeux clés euh, pour un bailleur euh, de fonds comme l'Agence française de développement, mais aussi pour la Banque mondiale, c'est d'éviter justement d'alimenter cette tendance de la recherche à être financée par le Nord et euh, d'imposer d'une certaine manière des problématiques de recherche euh, du Nord et donc qui ne concernent pas directement les problématiques de recherche euh, prioritaires du Sud. C'est la raison pour laquelle l'Agence française de développement finance, lorsqu'elle finance la recherche, elle finance la recherche dans des cadres nationaux pour euh, s'assurer que ce soit des financements qui viennent financer les programmes de recherche et de développement prioritaires pour les pays africains. Docteur, Docteur Quentin, euh, please. Docteur oui. Quentin, yes. euh, on a une contrainte de temps, s'il te plaît, si tu peux résumer en une minute, parce qu'on n'a pas le temps, parce qu'on va laisser quand même un peu de temps pour les, les questions, s'il te plaît. OK. Et donc, c'est une dernière slide, la dernière slide du point de vue pour, pour aller un peu plus, pour, pour prendre un peu plus de hauteur. 
nous, les trois peut-être constats euh, autour de, de la question donc, du changement climatique et de l'importance du, du rôle donc, des, des établissements d'enseignement supérieur, le premier point, c'est d'aller sur un continuum éducatif. Donc, on constate que le rôle d'enseignement supérieur et recherche est clé, mais si on ne, ré, si on ne, on ne fait pas, euh, de, de, donc, si on, on, on ne regarde pas ce qui se passe de, plus tôt dans l'éducation, notamment au niveau de l'éducation de base, l'éducation euh, professionnelle, il y aura forcément des enjeux donc d'avoir un plus gros stock d'étudiants en sciences euh, et d'avoir de, de, une rénovation de l'enseignement des sciences très tôt et pas uniquement au niveau de l'enseignement supérieur. Un autre point important, je vais très vite, hein, désolé, c'est le rôle donc, de l'enseignement supérieur et de la recherche et par exemple des centres d'excellence sur euh, la connaissance des risques, et des impacts et des développements et des conséquences sur le changement climatique. Et là, ce qu'on observe en tant que bailleur de fonds, c'est le fait qu'il y a des, beaucoup de manques en termes d'équipement de détection par exemple, pour créer de la capacité de données sur le changement climatique, que ce soit sur l'agriculture, que ce soit sur les, les, la, dé, la dégradation côtière et ces aspects-là. Et un autre aspect clé, euh, c'est véritablement la, la, la capacité de connectivité, donc la capacité à disposer en fait, d'instruments de, de, de recherche, donc par exemple des, des centres de calcul qui soient connectés et qui aient la capacité d'avoir des, 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 des données, euh, de créer des données, de les faire circuler, euh, de les dans des conditions de sécurité. Donc là, c'est un point très important, c'est notamment les, les NREN, donc les National Research and Education Network, qui sont très importants pour que la recherche africaine ait une capacité à produire ses propres données et à les faire circuler dans des conditions de sécurité. Et un dernier aspect, c'est l'aspect qui a été évoqué, c'est l'aspect multidisciplinaire et aussi l'aspect multiniveau multi de l'intervention de l'enseignement supérieur. Quand on voit, par exemple, les problématiques d'agroécologie, ça ne concerne pas uniquement l'enseignement supérieur, ça concerne la décision publique, les investissements publics, mais aussi, le, au jour le jour, les décisions prises par les agriculteurs, par les, tous les intermédiaires de la chaîne sur l'agriculture. Et donc, ça nécessite à la fois de la recherche, mais de la recherche qui soit ouverte vers les décideurs, qui soit ouverte aussi vers le secteur privé. Donc, ça, c'est quelque chose de vraiment d'essentiel. Donc, là, je, je, c'est extrêmement rapide, mais je, je pense que c'est ah, temps peut-être de laisser de la place pour les, pour les questions. Merci beaucoup, Dr. Quentin. Uh, again, uh, you summarize that the agency is heavily involved in capacity building. Uh, all the speakers really stress the capacity building, I mean, developing future leaders on around the climate change challenge. So, I have to thank uh, probably a quick. Uh, one or two quick questions, because we have uh, less than five minutes to, uh, yeah, please, if you can have the microphone. Uh, microphone, oh. Thank you very much for the opportunity. My question goes to Lingsi. Um, the RCF alumni network will be launched today. And one of our proposed aims is to become a center. Uh, if you could just speak closer to the microphone because we are not hearing you. All right. Uh so I said, um, my question goes this way. The RCF alumni network will be launched today. And one of our proposed aims um, is to become a multidisciplinary research hub to address regional challenges mm. such as climate change. The question is, what possible ways can we collaborate to realize the goals you stipulated? Thank you. So who can address this question? Lindsay. Uh, let's, okay, Professor Lindsay, go ahead, please. Thank you. No, that's that's a really, really good question, because I think networks and partnership are at the core of sharing climate change knowledge. Um, and it's great to hear that the hub is, is going to be multidisciplinary as well, because we need those insights from, from different disciplines. In terms of how to collaborate, that really depends on what the network members want to get out of it. Uh, we talk about networks and partnership a lot. Um, 
but they only work when it's clear as to what the members, what, what is the supply and demand thing, really. It's, it depends what the, the network members want to get out of it and how they can then further the activities of the network. So I think engaging with your network members from, from the very beginning to identify, you know, is it that you want newsletters from the network on a regular basis? Is, is it that you want an online collaboration space? Find out what the network members want and how they can engage most effectively and find out also what they can deliver for the network. Is it a case of the network members spreading the word about the network through their professional affiliations, through their institutions? Yeah, I think it's it has to be it has to come from the network members and, and they have to have ownership of the network, so to say, and, and buy into it for it to, to be a success. So there's no magic recipe how to collaborate, but there is good practice in terms of stakeholder engagement from the beginning, finding out what people want and then trying to accommodate that with the available resources <laughs> as far as far as is possible. Thank you so much. Uh, here is a last question it's from uh, online uh, colleagues. Uh, uh, a question ag again to you, uh, Professor Lancey. Uh, this person is asking, uh, how, what, how do you define uh, green growth, especially in Africa where agriculture is the cornerstone of the economies in many countries? Please go ahead, uh, Professor Lancey. Thank you. Yeah, a green growth. Well, any growth needs to be green. I, I said this in my talk. And in, in Africa, the challenge is that you've got vast numbers of people that are dependent on agriculture and food production. And obviously, food security is a, a really key thing. But at the same time, the size of a lot of the farms means that actually, if people stay in agriculture, then in, in some ways, they're staying in poverty, they get locked into cycles of poverty. So finding ways to add value to agricultural products to raise them out of poverty, that can help grow the economy, as well as making sure that the food security side of things and food production isn't, isn't risked and, and undermined. There's roles for organizational aspects, such as development of cooperatives, so that people can work together to cut costs, to be able to engage in new value chains and access new markets. And I think all those things are going to be key for green growth. Um, as we move forward under a climate change future. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Lancey. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gulan. Thank you so much, Dr. Quentin. It has been a wonderful uh, session. Let uh, all the speakers stress uh, capacity building, building really future leaders on uh, uh, climate change uh, uh, issues. Uh, of course, uh, partnership uh, is a key again, uh, multi-institutional, multi-disciplinary are key uh, words. Uh, um, system approaches again. So if you want really to tackle climate change issues properly. And with this, I would like to thank you so much and big applause for our speakers, please. Thank you so much. Another round of applause, please. Thank you so much. Great, so um, we will move on to the next panel discussion. And uh, this one is uh, on innovative climate uh, solutions. And um, it will be led by Professor Gani Chibuni of UM6P while he makes his way here on stage. I will uh, uh, say a few words about, about him. Um, Professor Chibuni is uh, leading, or he is the lead at the Center of Remote Sensing and Application at the, and the International Water Research Institute, WRI. And He studied for his bachelor's and master's and, uh, uh, in fluid mechanics and environmental science at the University of Toulouse. And uh, that was in the early 80s. And he has uh, his PhD from the University of Toulouse as well from 2006. He has spent two years at NASA 
and joined IRD France, where he worked as the uh, director of international product, pro projects dealing with remote sensing, hydrology, uh, climate in different parts of the world, including right here in Morocco, Niger, Tunisia, Egypt, jo Jordan, Mexico, and the US. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Chibuni. A round of applause. We can do better. Thank you. Thank you for making me much younger than I am. Uh, actually, I got my PhD in, my, uh, in 1992, which is, which is more than two, uh, 40, uh, 30 years ago, I guess. Uh, okay, uh, I think today we will be uh, in this panel with our distinguished uh, uh, panelist who will talk about climate smart solution uh, in the context of climate change. I would like to say two words. The first one is, as a lot of uh, previous speakers have stated, Africa is not responsible for the consequence, uh, for the reason of climate change but Africa is facing the consequences of climate change. So the key question here, and based on the opportunity of COP21 that has been confirmed by COP22, which put the adaptation in the same level, then the attenuation offer a great opportunity for the academic because there is no adaptation without innovation. However, the innovation as we, we used to think of in the early 80s, it's over. The time of the knowers impose their knowledge to the other is over. The in innovation has to be co-constructed. We have to put together what we call the in, uh, collective intelligence that we, that ensure that the experience of the scientists, of the manager, of the local population that has been adapted to, 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 to environment change for, 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 for centuries has to be taken advantage of and to co-build a solution together. This is the only condition that to ensure the sustainability and to, to, uh, to ensure the appropriation of whatever solution that has been developed. For the past 50 years, my colleague from IFD know it, we thought that the development in West Africa, it, is, it is all, should be only driven by technology, which is not true. I mean, the reality is not true. The development is the entire value chain is of course technology, but is also social, economic, cultural, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So today's session is I would like our uh, our speaker to address one specific question: How this situation of climate change in Africa can be transformed to opportunity? The opportunity to address the major challenges in different way. And let me start here by Dr. Sraj. Uh, if, I, if I take all time to present all the CV of our, our panelists, I will, I will stay here until 6 p.m. But Dr. <laughs> Dr. Sraj is one of the famous Moroccan scientists that has spent more than 30 years in the international arena on the issue of, uh, of uh, uh, agriculture, agriculture adaptation to climate change. And uh, he's now the head of strategy at UM6P. Dr. Sergej, welcome. Good morning, everyone. And thank you very much, uh, Sir Shabuni. The question I think is a 
very simple, but also complex. How do we basically, how do we turn the climate change challenges into opportunities? And as uh, the introduction of Mr. Jabouni has said, well, Africa has somehow to pay for mistakes or for challenges that have been put forward by others. But this is the situation where we are, and we are in the academic arena. So we want to keep it on the, on the positive side, on the hope side. And I think there is a, quite a lot of opportunities in front of us as African universities, as if we want to put it in that context, we have a huge responsibility for bringing up the new generations that will be making all these opportunities become real. So let me start from uh, where we left it, the latest report of the IPCC. There are six. Some of you might have heard already some of the conclusions. A lot of it is actually not new because we know that uh, CO2 is raising, temperature is raising, extreme events are going up. So we know all of those. Now what we, what we are learning more and more is more of an, the way for coping with all this. And that's where I think our role comes in, is the role of innovation, the role of science, the role of capacity building, as, as we've heard. So what the report is saying, for instance, I'll just pick up a short paragraph, if you allow me, because I think it's, it's, it's extremely relevant to our discussion today. And it's talking about maladaptation, because we've been talking about adaptation for, for quite some time, but this term of maladaptation means something different. It means that it's a major problem, that, and, and, and we have several examples of maladaptation, of a diversity of technological and institutional options that are common to agricultural development. And here the focus is agriculture because that's the key for, for food security in Africa. So we, wanna, we, we don't want to talk about maladaptation in other sectors, but right now, if we look at food security and agriculture, so we have the technologies, but uh, yeah, so we have, for instance, new varieties to face drought and salinity and temperature. Uh, we have intensification solutions. We have water management and irrigation solutions. We have digital agriculture solutions. We've heard this is all available today. But yet, even with all that, and even with, with safety net programs and, and all the money that sometimes we're injecting in, in, in the communities, we, 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 we don't get to the real solutions. And this is what, what maladaptation means. So these are options uh, that are in context seen as very important for adaptation, but uh, they are not magic sticks. So this is what, what, what this all means. It means that we have to adjust the solutions to the local context. And this is where we were starting basically a whole new era for, for research. So a research that concerns targeting, and this is really the word I want to highlight here. There is no magic stick that comes across all this, the, the, you know, and I can give examples. Uh, if we start, for instance, looking at what we call climate smart agriculture. Climate smart agriculture has been designed I had the opportunity being at FAO for some time and a part of that process that have been developing the CSA, what we call now CSA in the jargon, Climate Smart Agriculture Solutions. And there is a whole battery of solutions. So what uh, the program on, on CCAS and the World Bank have done recently, a few years back, they have looked at all those solutions of CSA across Africa and they've done country profiling. So here, what did we do? We, we went into specific each country and looking at its context and its challenges and trying to find what solutions will be more adequate. So what emerges from that is no big surprise. We know that, for instance, uh, water management, uh, uh, tolerant varieties for agriculture. This is all part of the solution. But the thing here, and this is the key point, is that some solutions can work in some specific con contexts and does not work in other contexts. And I can, I can give many examples. Today, for instance, we're talking a lot about conservation agriculture. Now it has emerged in several African countries, including Morocco right now, we're investing heavily in, in, in conservation agriculture, zero tillage and all that. And the experience has shown that conservation agriculture indeed 
works in, in, in multi-environment, but it doesn't work everywhere. And we have many, many examples that have been documented, for instance, from my little experience, I've worked in, in you know, and, and I've seen reports on, on uh, countries in Africa, like Zambia, Malawi, uh, I did once, uh, you know, an, 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 a research in, in Eritrea and other countries, and you can see that some of the solutions are not adjusted to the local context. So that's, that's I think, a key point. And this is for me the key message I would like to, to end up here, at least for now, is that we need to do better targeting. So the research has to go out of that blanket solutions that we extrapolate across all the continent and start being specific to the local context and the targeting. So I want to keep it there. I don't want to take too much of your time. There is a lot to say about this, but I think this is for me the key message is about targeting, is about local context, and it's about finding solutions to the maladaptation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sagaj. Uh, definitely, I think the, the, key, uh, the key question is there is no solution that fit all. All the solution has to be targeted to a given context. It, it can be geogra geographic context, economic context, cultural context. This is why we have to, to work on the local population, to, look on, uh, to, to work on the stakeholder, because they are the one who knows the ecosystem, they know the history, they know the challenges. So our next speaker is uh, Professor Kony Dauda. Professor, is he? Please, Professor. Professor Kony Dauda is well recognized professor in mycology and agrophysiology. He did a lot of work on one of the critical issues related to climate change, which is the adaptation of our agriculture to diseases related to climate change. Dr. Dauda, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Good morning. Uh, uh, all the protocol observed. I want again to appreciate uh, the organizers of this meeting. So I'm here uh, just so to share with uh, uh, the audience uh, what we what we are doing in terms of uh, but I, I want to say uh, I don't know how to swap how to swap. So I want to say, yes, uh, adaptation is something very good because we know uh, during a lot of COPs have been passed. And uh, during, uh, after the COP 15, we have seen that most of the country have developed the adaptation plan. This is a very important move. Yes, and most of the country have developed the adaptation plan. This is very important. And what we can do also, Yes, I agree with uh, Prof uh, saying that uh, we need to uh, target specific uh, 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 communities where we are developing this adaptation plan. But you know, all, all the country, African countries, we have a specific adaptation plan after the Paris Agreement. We need also to support the country to follow those adaptation plan. And also, one of the things, one of the most important is to conceptualize this adaptation plan is very important. If you don't conceptualize, you will develop some technologies who, where we will not need, you will not see anybody coming to take those technologies. We know in uh, what we are doing in terms of uh, our training strategies, we work uh, in collaboration, we co-develop, we also co-implement. But one thing is the students are developing technology. Yesterday we have seen a lot of technology. We can find a lot, but how now, those technology can be used for the need or can be addressed to the communities. This is a key point. Uh, I've seen we have a, uh, we are trying to develop the link between universities, between uh, student and industry. But we need also to think about those who need really our data, those who need really our finding is those people who are sitting in the villages. They don't have any technologies. They have a lot of products. But they are losing, losing a lot of product. They don't have technology reaching them. 
but we have those technology uh, developing. We are doing nice publication with uh, impact factor, yes, but we need also to take those publications to address this to the end users. This is where we are talking about also services. The service is very important for us. In addition to the publication, how can we develop services? Those services can be delivered to the end users. This is where also we need to fill this gap. And we need to also see, we are going to take those technology to the end users. These are the extension services. We also not need to focus only in developing PhD master. What we are doing in our center of excellence is to develop the short courses curricula because we need to develop a massive training. If you take the population of Africa, we are in West Africa, for example, we have three, 300 million of communities. If you want to only stand on PhD developing master student uh, uh, training, we not reach uh, people with uh, technology we are developing. So I just want to show some example, saying that I agree totally, we need to conceptualize the need of having uh, this adaptation plan. And uh, so we can conceptualize it according to the community we want to reach. This is what we are doing main, mainly uh, during our, in our training program. We have PhD program, those programs have already accredited uh, during our previous uh, uh, development with World Bank. But after we developed the master program, because we said that PhD is not enough, we cannot develop a lot of PhD program and those PhD will build the capacity. We also develop a publication, we develop paper, but we need technical paper. So we develop master program. And after the master program, we are now doing uh, what we call the short courses program to address the challenges. We also develop policy document, what we do is for all of our PhD and master student at the end of uh, the, uh, the, the, the program, they transform the master thesis and the PhD thesis into uh, what we call a policy brief. This policy brief is very important because we can address it to decision makers. It can be either uh, our decision, uh, uh, the decision, our responsible who are taking decision. It can also be to the farmer organization and also the ONGs. Uh, I want also to say, during the development on what we are doing, we can also, like sol green solution can go through the use of renewable in agriculture sector. For example, everything we are doing, if you have a, 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 a seed who are facing, who are resistant to a tolerant to drought, we need also to have a renewable energy to increase and integrate this renewable energy in agriculture sector. We can use uh, what we call the solar panel, use of, for, for example, for everything we are doing, irrigation system. I've seen uh, yesterday a lot of uh, strategy in irrigation, but we can also use the solar panel uh, to, for irrigation. That can bring you to not use the fuel and we can have a no CO2 emission. This is how we can also solve the problem of uh, green gas emission. We can also, in um, developing smart agriculture, we need to work with communities. When we send the student, for example, before he will go to develop his PhD proposal, he go to the community, discuss with them to co-develop the strategies where we, not, we go now into using some agro system, uh, a farming system, integrated farming system, uh, just uh, to develop. Don't uh, use the, the burning system we are using. We need to avoid all of those things. Now we need also to build our agriculture in a kind of way where we can protect the environment using biological solution, using agroforestry strategies, and also uh, we move, and after we move also to use the, the, the smart solution for irrigation. We need also to integrate the, in our system, the crop who can support also, the crop who are beneficial crop. Yes, we don't need to just maintain our uh, farm if uh, only one crop, we need to have a diverse crop. So that can help also community to diversify what they want to produce. And uh, one important thing also, we are trying to have a new solution. This is a green hydrogen. We are now developing a master of green hydrogen. 
Yes, this master of green hydrogen can help us to produce, because we have also the gray hydrogen, we have the blue hydrogen. I'm talking about the green hydrogen, where we can produce hydrogen using also uh, renewable energy. And also instead of using the fossil hydrogen, this hydrogen will give you zero emission because the end product is water. If you use this hydrogen technology, you can use it to produce fuel. That fuel can be used for lighting. The fuel also can be used to move all the engine we are going to use in the agriculture sector. Uh, for example, also, one important thing that I think Prof talked about this is climate, climate smart, uh, and climate uh, and, and service, uh, uh, how to say, uh, climate information services. We are working with communities. Those communities don't have any information about climate. This is very important in our daily activity, how we can develop service climate information that can go through the communities sitting in the villages where they are losing their, their, their crop after harvesting. Also where also they are losing some information in terms of having any climate data, where for example, if I'm sitting somewhere, I want to harvest my crop and I don't have any information about raining. If I harvest today and it's rain today, this is a bad situation for me. If I want to spray a pesticide, I don't have any information about it, if it is rain or not. This is where we need also to educate community, community, our communities with climate information service. This is very important in our daily activity. And also it should be included in terms of, uh, as a prof said, including those aspects in our curricula will help our communities First, starting by our PhD student, starting also by those who are managing our university, and also the end person will be the student who are collecting data. So those students can also bring the data to the communities in terms of climate information services. If you want to use any pesticide, you need to know if it's rain or not. If you want also to have information about the market, I produce my tomato, I want to sell it tomorrow, and maybe uh, close to me, there is a market where the, the, the price is very low. And maybe at one kilometer, I can have a very high price. So I need to have all of those information so I can bring my tomato where I can get a lot of revenue. This is some information I want to share. But again, we need to work closer to the end users. We need also to take into consideration the need in terms of developing adaptation strategies. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Professor. I think that you, you mentioned one of the black spots in Africa regarding climate, uh, climate research, which is climate data. We are lacking climate data. And, you know, the, the donors are not very excited, are not very excited in funding, you know, data collection effort. Now, there, is, there are a bunch of satellite data that exists. But the reality is in the ground, we need data on the ground, med station, piezometric data, soil data, etc. And this is very costly. And uh, neither the government nor the, the, the funding agency are eager to, to do this. We need to do a lot of, of effort because it's critical parameter, as Professor said, for, for the entire value chain. Thank you. The next, the, uh, our next speaker will be distinguished uh, scientist, Dr. Tudomi Loranda. She's an agriculture economist and leading and program officer of a think tank operating in, in Benin, which is include the entire value chain, research, education, policy, for the, the objective of combating desertification, poverty, and hunger. Please. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Um, je suis Lorena Todome. Je suis béninoise de nationalité et agroéconomiste de formation. Je suis particulièrement heureuse de participer à ce panel aux côtés de l'un des brillants professeurs que j'ai eu la chance de croiser au cours de ma thèse de doctorat, professeur de Cali. Et actuellement, 
comme le modérateur l'a dit, je suis chargée de programme au Centre d'action pour l'environnement et le développement durable, à ACED, qui est un think and do tank basé au Bénin et spécialisé dans la production et la dissémination des données probantes sur différentes thématiques comme la sécurité alimentaire, les changements climatiques et les innovations digitales. Pour revenir à votre question, la fonte des glaciers, les feux de forêt dans l'Arctique qui normalement est gelé, nous rappellent bien la réalité des changements climatiques et surtout que désormais nous devons composer avec les changements climatiques. Au niveau des scientifiques, la question principale qui se dégage, c'est que pouvons-nous faire face aux changements climatiques? Est-ce que nous devons procéder à des changements radicaux de nos habitudes, comme ne plus manger de la viande ou aller au travail, par exemple, à vélo? C'est vrai, ce sont des solutions. Mais ces solutions semblent un peu limitées face à l'immensité des défis que représentent les changements climatiques. Et d'un autre côté, nous voyons que l'intelligence artificielle et digitale offre d'énormes possibilités de développer des solutions plus efficaces. L'intelligence artificielle peut permettre, par exemple, aux chercheurs de développer de nouvelles approches de tester de nouvelles idées très rapidement grâce à des logiciels. Si nous prenons par exemple la science des matériaux, où les scientifiques s'efforcent de trouver actuellement de nouveaux matériaux comme les batteries de nouvelle génération ou les combustibles solaires capables de stocker et d'exploiter au mieux l'énergie des ressources naturelles, nous voyons que l'intelligence artificielle permet d'aller plus vite. Donc, une recherche accélérée. Un autre domaine où l'intelligence artificielle a une forte incidence, c'est la télédétection. Parce que nous voyons que les satellites recouvrent de plus en plus la Terre, mais il y a un problème quant à l'exploitation des images obtenues par ces satellites pour pouvoir suivre des indicateurs importants comme la densité forestière, la biodiversité des écosystèmes ou les rendements agricoles. De ce fait, des systèmes d'intelligence artificielle pourraient permettre de rassembler toutes ces informations générées par les satellites et nous permettre de suivre de façon constante les indicateurs environnementaux dans le monde entier afin que nous puissions mieux nous adapter aux changements climatiques. Je dirais également que il y a d'autres utilisations potentielles de l'intelligence artificielle comme l'agriculture de précision ou le développement des solutions de réduction d'émissions de gaz à effet de serre quand nous prenons par exemple les réactions de fusion où l'intelligence artificielle permet de faire des expérimentations plus rapides Aujourd'hui, nous utilisons l'intelligence artificielle pour réduire la consommation énergétique dans les bâtiments, mais également pour détecter les, les fuites de méthane. Pour conclure sur cette question, je dirais que les changements climatiques constituent une réalité chez nous, mais l'intelligence artificielle et le digital nous offrent beaucoup d'opportunités pour développer des mesures adaptatives, mais également des mesures d'atténuation des effets des changements climatiques sur notre quotidien. Mais ne nous trompons pas sur cette réalité. L'intelligence artificielle n'est pas une panacée pour la planète. L'intelligence artificielle, à elle seule, ne peut pas permettre de venir à bout des défis du changement climatique. Donc, il est important que les chercheurs qui travaillent dans le domaine de l'intelligence artificielle, puissent collaborer avec d'autres chercheurs qui travaillent sur les changements climatiques pour développer des solutions beaucoup plus durables, beaucoup plus efficaces. Et je crois qu'en Afrique, on, nous n'avons pas encore véritablement perçu, nous n'exploitons pas véritablement ce potentiel que représentent les recherches sur l'intelligence artificielle 
en lien avec le changement climatique. Et j'espère que ce panel et surtout cette conférence va nous permettre de faire le point déjà sur tout ce qui est solution développée et surtout va permettre de nouvelles collaborations pour pouvoir développer de nouvelles solutions pour atténuer les effets du changement climatique et surtout des mesures d'adaptation au changement climatique. Merci beaucoup. Donc, pendant ces trois jours, on a vu plusieurs solutions qui, sont, qui ont été proposées. Mais à mon avis, pour être concret, en face des solutions, il faut mettre l'impact. Des solutions, ils doivent avoir, enfin, solutions, actions doivent avoir un impact sur la population, pour la lutte contre la pauvreté, pour la lutte contre la malnutrition, pour la santé humaine. Il faut, il faut définir des critères d'impact. Je pense que c'est fondamental dans nos futurs projets. Uh, next speaker, our friend, uh, Dr. Rachid Kouali. I don't know how to present you. <laughs> He's, He's a distinguished professor in a lot of things, actually, <laughs> in agronomy, in, in economics. He has more than 45 years' experience dealing with the issue of agriculture, agriculture economy, public policy, climate change. He's now between OCP Africa and, and uh, UM6P as professor And we are glad to have you at the university and glad to have you as part of this panel. Thank you. Est-ce qu'il y a pour euh, passer les slides? D'accord. Bon, D'abord, merci, euh, cher ami et Dr. Cherboni. Et, et aussi, je veux remercier ma, ma collègue. Euh, euh, d'avoir évoqué mon nom, mais en fait, c'est moi qui est fier d'être à côté d'elle. Parce que la fierté des enseignants, c'est de voir leurs étudiants exceller et les dépasser. Et donc, je suis très fier d'avoir Luanda, Luanda à côté de moi dans cette conférence. Merci. Donc, euh, je ne sais pas si tout le monde arrive à voir. Donc, la question qui m'a été posée, en fait, c'est voir le rôle des politiques dans, dans cette question-là. Et le rôle des politiques, en fait, en Afrique, quand on parle du changement climatique, à 95%, je dirais, on parle plutôt de l'agriculture que, comme a été dit par Dr. Serrej, on parle plus de l'agriculture que d'autres choses, puisque c'est le secteur le plus sensible en Afrique à le changement climatique. Et non seulement au changement climatique, mais au climat en général. Et donc, il est le, le, le plus concerné, etc. Et donc, moi, je vais aborder le sujet à travers l'angle de, de l'agriculture. Bon, D'abord, je veux remercier mes, les collègues qui m'ont précédé parce qu'ils m'ont facilité la chose. Je pensais parler un peu de l'importance de l'agriculture, de, de, du monde rural, etc., dans, en Afrique. Bon, cette population, effectivement, la population active qui représente plus de, 50, de 50 Pardon, je suis en train de parler en français. Je, je viens de me rendre compte. que. Je... Est-ce que c'est possible de continuer en français? D'accord. I am sorry. I was, I was speaking in French while my attention was to speak in English. So, so I was saying that uh, agriculture is the most, most sensitive sector to, to climate change. And I want to thank my colleagues that, uh, and uh, colleague, my colleague uh, Serej, who talks about the specificity of agriculture that is, I would say, uh, uh, locally specific. So you cannot think of agriculture in general. Gen agriculture is linked to to the space, so and is why it is sensitive also to the climate. And uh, <clears throat> let me just say. so talking about agriculture in Africa, the first thing that came in mind to uh, to mind is the the fact that uh, it's it's the this the food security issue. Well, which is very 
Well, there's a lot of things to say about food security in Africa because Africa is big exporter also of agriculture product, but it's becoming more and more an importer for basic, especially for basic food. And so the sec the, the, the product that is the most, that is growing uh, or the, the import that is growing in Africa is mainly, I will say, cereals. And uh, is why I want to talk about uh, cereals production. So if we see on this slide that the production it's increasing, in fact, in, in Africa, but the import is also increasing. So there is deficit by 2018, the deficit in cereals in Africa, is, it reached 25% of, uh, of the, the total demand of cereals in, in Africa. There are various explanation. One of them is the urbanization and the change of uh, the diet in Africa people urban are eating more cereals and less, I will say, uh, less, uh, uh, um, what they call it, um, cassava and less uh, uh, potatoes and less uh, beans. And they are moving to cereals like, and to rice, et cetera. So that increases the demand for, for this product. And that's, when you see the, the, this increase of demand for, for the, the import of cereals, the first thing that, that you think of is how, how come that Africa cannot cover its needs in this, in this product. So if we look to, to the yield for, for cereals in Africa, well, cereal is easy topic to talk about in agriculture because you can add all the cereals and measure the, 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 the volume of cereals. You cannot add beef to, to apples or anything, but you can add rice to, to wheat and to other products. So is why we talk a lot about cereals. When we talk about food security, we don't talk about vegetables. We don't talk about, I don't know, animal uh, meat and this kind of thing. So, when you see the yield, the yield in, in Africa increased by about 100% in the last 60 years. But when you compare to other continents, the other continent decreased at least by 200% in all the other continents. So Africa is lagging behind uh, when, you, when you look at the, the yield. But problem also, when you look to, to the cropped area of cereals, you see that the cropped area increased in Africa by about 100%. 20%, while in other continents, it has its tendency to decrease even. While the, the yield is increasing and the, 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 the cropped area in the other continent is decreasing, which, which raises the question, like if we want to really, if we continue on this path, that means that we will be using more land, which means more deforestation, which means more, I would say, uh, environmental catastrophe. So that's one of the, the problem that, uh, that we have. So when we look to the import of food in general, we find that there is deficit on, on the trade balance. And that deficit now is reaching something like 40% between the trade balance of food between export and import. And it has tendency to increase. And uh, so if we want to really to overcome this problem of, of food security, we have really to increase the, 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 the productivity and not to increase the, the use of land. And, but the problem in Africa is like we see that the population, as it was mentioned before, is increasing something like 2.5% each year. But the productivity in a, the total productivity in agriculture is increasing only by around 1.1%, which means in 2050, the, the demand for the, the, the population, which means the demand for food will double in next 30 years, but the production will increase only by 40%. That means the gap between the demand and the production will increase widely in 2050. <clears throat> so as it was said by uh, 
by Dr. Serraj is like, we have all the technology. The problem is like, we don't use the, all the available technology because of access to this technology, because of the transfer of this technology and this kind of thing. So when you see the total, the, the productivity in Africa, here, this, this graph that was done by the USDA, by a friend of mine, because we, he was my classmate, it's Dr. Fugli. In, in USDA. So if you see that Sub-Saharan Africa is lagging, didn't move from the 60s, practically the productivity didn't move from the 60s, while all the other continents are moving northeast, uh, northeast. Well, Africa is staying in the same place. The, the productivity doesn't change at all, practically. But if we you take the total productivity of factor, maybe I am talking some language that some people will not understand. It's like when I, when I go back to, to this one. This one is gives the frontier of the productivity, the, the frontier of productivity. And we have here the productivities in 1961 and the productivity in 2006. So that's about 50 years uh, between the two frontiers. So you see that America, North America is mo moved to this <laughs> new frontier. Uh, Northeast Asia moved to this new frontier in, the, in 2006, but Africa stayed in the same productivity as it was in 1960. That means that we are lagging, not only we, are, we were lagging in the 60s, but we don't move for, uh, uh, we, we don't advance this productivity. But if we look to the total factor productivity, all the, continent, all the other continents, they, they see their total factor productivity. When we say total factor productivity, that means the productivity of all the factor involved, land, labor, capital, and everything that is involved in the production of agriculture. So if you measure the total for, uh, factor productivity, in between 2001 and, zero and 2000, uh, 2001 and 2009, this productivity increased only by 0 0.51. While in Brazil, for instance, it's, it increased by, well, the, the rate of increase was 4%. That's eight times what happened in, in, in Africa. So, <clears throat> So the problem is like now that we have this picture of this, I will say, under development of agriculture, the question is what we expect from the technology. As it was said before, we expect from this technology and innovation to adapt the existing technology to the local, to the diverse African situations or condition. We want to use this digitalization and information and communication uh, technology to mobilize the, ex, uh, the, the extraordinary accumulation of agronomic knowledge. In fact, in the last 60 years, there was a lot of investment in research in agriculture, but we couldn't exploit that because, the, the, because we were lagging the means to, to do it. Now with this new technology, we can, we can use all that knowledge the third thing that we expect is to adapt the agriculture production to the new climate change, which is another constraint on agriculture, another, just one other constraint on, on agriculture, and hopefully to, to, to innovate. Okay, I am going, I, I try to. So that's what is expected. And, and we need to get policy rights. To, to do that, we need to get the policy rights and policy to resolve the sector major constraint. And this major constraint from my point of view are the land tenure in Africa. It's, an, it's the only country, uh, continent where we still have about more than 90% of land is tribal land. So that's discourage any investment, any adoption of new technology or anything. The, we need to facilitate the access to modern inputs and modern technology to facilitate the access to financial markets for well, banking and uh, insurances. But also we need policy that, that increase public investment and provision of rural infrastructure. 
and we need also to improve the, the supply of general services. And one thing that most of people are forgetting is the supply of public goods, which means education, uh, research, and these kind of things. But we, the problem is like when you see all these things, and you know, when you talk to all the African decision maker and the researcher, most of people, they think that we are, uh, we are supporting agriculture, but when you look closely to, to the policy that are in place and you measure things correctly, you find that in general there is negative economic political support to agriculture. How we can, and this is common knowledge because most of the international organizations they were measuring the support, the economic support to agriculture. This is study that was done by the World Bank by Kim Anderson, while well, he did it over uh, 15 countries in Africa, uh, yeah, 16 African countries. And he found that the nominal rate of assistance in agriculture, which measures the policy, the price policies and the general support to agriculture, it was negative for the, for the last, last 60 years. While for no agriculture tradable, it was positive support. Just one, one last slide. Now, there is now a consortium led by the IFPRI, which include FAO, it include the, the IFPRI itself, it include the World Bank, to measure what they call the nominal rate of protection. A nominal rate of protection, it measures only the, the, the protections or the support, the price support, which means the 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 the, the, support, the, the protection at the frontier, which is the the, the tariffs or or the the uh, quantitative restrictions and the prices, the market prices, and when you look to this in in Europe. The support is always, it has always been positive to agriculture. North America, it's also positive. In Asia, it has always been positive. The only country, well, in Latin America, in some, some years it was negative, and sometimes it was positive. In Africa, it has always been negative, which means that when we see negative nominal rates of protection, it means something like, it means taxation and direct taxation to agriculture. So globally, agriculture in Africa was taxed by between 30 and 10% tax and direct taxes, which means that even though that's most of the, 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 the leader in Africa, they're saying that they are supporting agriculture, in fact, and directly they were taxing it. And that's what I, I call the, the, the uh, the cheap food trap, the cheap food trap that most of African leaders, they are afraid of urban population. So they want to have cheap food for urban population and they make the rural pay for it because the price of imports, because the, 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 all developed countries, they are supporting their agriculture. That's mean that they are selling food at lower price than the cost. And that's well, that's imposed on African farmers to sell their food at that price, which means there is tax. That means that we are making, by, by playing by the international prices and the import, we are making the, the poor farmers and the poor rural population pay the cost of low food, low, uh, yeah, I would say cheap food for urban population, including the rich and the poor, not just the poor in rural, in urban population, but also the rich. So the poor in rural area are paying the price for cheap food for total urban population. And that's the, the main problem, I guess, for agriculture in Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dukwali. Uh, let me, I left the best for, for, for the end. Let me introduce Ms. Ms. Nana Okier-Badou. 
a PhD student from the University of Ghana. And uh, please join the floor. This is the future of Africa. Thank you very much, Professor. And um, a warm good morning, good afternoon to um, all our participants here and um, those joining online. Um, so I'm, I'm very privileged today to sit among this um, August panel to um, also share my views on this very sensitive topic of climate change in Africa. So I'm going to be speaking from the context of the effects of um, climate change on markets, and um, in particular, markets related to um, agriculture. Right, so like, um, like has been discussed, there are going to be um, some increases in global temperature. Now, these will affect agriculture significantly um, in, in lots of ways. So, According to the FAO, um, a 1.5 to 4 degrees Celsius increase in temperature this century could lead to yield losses of up to 50% in crop production in Africa. Again, um, this will translate into GDP losses of 2 to 4% for, of course, sub-Saharan African countries. And in, in, in most countries in Africa, agriculture accounts for about 20% of GDP. By an actual fact, this is a lot higher because this calculation of GDP does not take into context um, agriculture related activities such as agro-processing, agri-finance and all of those. So if you added that, this figure would be a lot, a lot higher. And so ultimately this will result in a lot of factors such as food insecurity. And so the statistics say that um, food insecurity, which in Africa is around 24%, could increase to as high as 40 to 50% of the population if this is not controlled. Now, at, at the micro level, at the country level, um, this, this has a lot of repercussions. So as we, we all know, um, one fifth of South Saharan Africa's economy is related to agriculture, like I said. Now, this includes around about 50 to 60% of the working population who are involved in agriculture or agriculture related activity. And so that's, that's a very significant number of the population who could end up um, being deprived of livelihoods, right? But beyond, beyond this, there's also some facets to, to, to address. So first of all, there's already a very big gap between financing to agriculture and its contribution to um, GDP. So in Africa, GDP from agriculture is about 20%, but you find that in most countries, financing to agriculture is around four to 5%. Now the, the CADIP framework is working on raising this to at least 10% of GDP, but still yet, this is, this is still to be achieved. And to terrorist purpose, if things remain the way they are, it will mean that this situation will become uh, worse. Because why, why is there low supply of finance to agriculture? So banks in general perceive agric to be risky. And with yield, with yields reducing, this will further ex exacerbate. Now at the global level, I'd like to talk about some of the impacts to uh, markets. Right? So the uh, McKinsey conducted a research and found that if we were to transition abruptly from um, all the, 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 the fossil fuels and going to greening and all of that, we could end up affecting a sector which contributes about 20% of global GDP, right? So I think our speakers before have spoken about maladaptation and so this, this is something that's, that's very key to consider. 
um, again, in terms of jobs, it could lead to the creation of 200 million new jobs globally. That is implementing uh, climate smart solutions. But as well, it could lead to the loss of around 185 million jobs. And that's a different kind of vulnerability that we will be creating. And um, for countries like my, my country, Ghana, who are dependent on fossil fuels um, for a large chunk of their revenue, this could be very detrimental. So for example, in Ghana, revenue from oil contributes about 4% of GDP. And um, there's further revenue from um, taxes on fuel products as well. So you can imagine what damage will be done to the economy um, if this suddenly goes away. And so unfortunately, some countries like uh, mine have joined the, the oil and gas tea party a little bit too late, right? And um, at the global level, of course, a lot is being done to make sure that new financing solutions are sustainable and are green. So the, the network for greening of financial systems, which is a consortium of central banks, is at the global level working towards this. But however, that impact needs to, it needs to cascade down to our local um, levels, right? So the, while all the institutions like the NGFS are trying to create global green financing systems at the local level as well. And we, we've spoken about how climate smart solutions need to be targeted, right? It needs to have a different solution for, for each country, right? So at the local level as well, something similar has to be done, right? So there needs to be action at the local level to create financing solutions which are green and which work for the local population. And here, research is very important. So um, Professor Lindsay mentioned something about systems thinking. And similarly, there are, there are research methodologies such as design thinking, which can be used to develop smarter, more, more feasible financing solutions for agriculture. Um, I would like to further comment on this by giving some context as to how um, innovations, which, which make sure that um, rural communities can participate better and are more adapted to climate change and its effects um, can be more feasible. So um, I think one of the speakers spoke about climate uh, innovations in terms of climate information systems. So I've been privileged as part of my PhD to um, work with um, Isoko. And Isoko is one of the companies which are pioneering um, climate innovation services. And so there's a service which provides um, climate information, um, weather information, market prices, in local languages using a variety of, of media. So there's text messaging, there's voice messaging to um, rural communities. And um, this, this model is very feasible and represents one of um, such innovative, um, innovative climate information service solutions. However, still, this is not bereft of, of um, challenges, right? So in order for a climate innovation service to be sustainable and to work, um, you, you will need to have it in local languages. You need to take into account local knowledge, like we mentioned. You also need to take into account um, the livelihood patterns of the people you're designing it for. Um, you need to account for vulnerability, for gender, and make sure that the technology which is delivering the service works. And this is not just for climate innovation services. The same applies to any innovative solution which is meant to further um, improve the inclusion of the rural poor or the rural folk who are involved in smallholdership in financial or in general in markets, right? All of these measures apply. But you find that there's, there's a lot of drawback to models like this. Um, first of all, it's illiteracy because a lot of the rural folk um, cannot read, write, especially in the languages that these solutions or technologies come in. And so it's difficult for, for them to be taught and to apply. Um, there's also challenges of connectivity. A lot of these solutions run on internet and in um, remote areas, these are not possible, right? So even sometimes solutions such as um, 
smart smart agricultural technologies like what um, my 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 uh, my senior Dr. Aifa is is working on. Some of these need to be um, helped if they're supposed to expand to uh, last mile communities. And then of, of course as well, there's the big issue. So who pays for the service that reaches the farmer, right? And a sustainable model around that needs to be found because currently what happens is institutions such as the World Bank, IFAD, um, FAO pay for these projects. And um, whilst it is very good for the farmers, once the, the project ends, they are not able or willing to pay for it. And so the service is discontinued. So it is very important to come up with a model which has um, a sustainable paying um, solution as part of it. And I think that's again where research comes in. So I, I want to propose a theory which I call evidence-based marketing. So rural folk are more um, receptive to solutions and will be more willing to pay for it if marketing is done around success stories. And so research needs to go into impact assessments of some of these technologies and use that in collaboration with industry to market such technologies to the farmers. And I believe this is something which will work and needs to be pursued aggressively. And I will end by talking about um, some, some of the roles that RCIF in general has observedly played in, um, in, 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 in making some of these things um, a reality. So first of all, um, I will use myself an ex as an example. So through RCIF's um, scholarship schemes, um, individuals like me can research and participate in the development of solutions to um, answer some of these things, right? So for example, my research is around um, economic profitability instead of using accounting profitability. So like uh, the last speaker said, um, if you look at um, the, um, there's, there's an indirect taxation to agriculture, right? And so if you use uh, accounting measures of profitability to calculate, you would not see this. But if you take into context the um, effects of taxation, of indirect uh, taxation of policies, of tariffs, and all of those things, you see that profitability is different. And that's one of the measures of um, profitability that should be promoted. Again, our solu support to research institutions allows us to further create solutions which, which will assist. And then also in terms of content development through the, the results of the research. I think this is another area which needs, um, which RCIF is, is, is done well with doing. And then finally, networking, um, like events like this, bring together different minds from different um, walks of um, society, of, of the, the economy and of research. And so whatever solutions that come out from such partnerships, it addresses all of the facets of the problem. And I think this is one area that um, RCIF has done very well with. So um, I think to conclude, I'd like to say, um, it's important that we make sure that rural communities and farmers can be able to participate more in um, the markets in a way that is adaptive to the changing um, climate and to, to, sorry, to the changing uh, markets which have been as a result or which will be a result of climate change. Right, thank you. Thank you, thank you gentlemen. Since we are uh, almost on time, uh, to be fair in terms of time allowance, I would like to, to give the floor again to my friend, Dr. Siraj, to give us for two, three minutes some concluding remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shabuni. So I'll try to keep it short because I think uh, we've covered quite a lot of areas and you know, and this is obviously not the first time and it's not gonna be the last time we're talking about climate change. We're gonna be here and around that this is going to stick with us for a while. So I just wanna keep my message focused and going back again to CSA where I left it, climate smart agriculture. Of course there was a lot of work behind it, but in a nutshell, what it means, it just means that we are bringing together in one package, 
integrated solutions that look not only at adaptation, but look at the same time food security, and this is the, the key, and also mitigation. Because we cannot have piecemeal solutions that start looking at adaptation on its own and looking at mitigation and look at the whole idea here of, of working on CSA is being able to bring this together in one package and integrate. I think this is a key message about CSA. Now, going back to that report I was mentioning earlier with uh, CCAFs and World Bank, we've done a large survey across the 38 countries we've done the profiling asking a very simple question. They're saying, what are the barriers? What prevents us from moving this down the road? And they've done a statistic. So the first one, the number one barrier is actually training and information sharing. And this is from all the experts working on climate and CSA. I, I, I forgot the, the person about it, I think it was like 70% is training and information sharing. So here you go. I think uh, for all of us being here in the academic area, uh, we've got some work to do. So this is number one. Number two, and it, it's about the, 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 the tools and the enabling environments, because technology alone cannot do it. I think as my colleague and friend Rashid Dukali has mentioned it, we need to pay a lot of attention to the enabling environment. You cannot assume that just putting the technology out there will deliver the solution. So we have to look at the policies, you have to work on the institutional systems. You have to look at the incentives systems and how do we get this moving down to farmers? Now, of course, when we're talking about the, uh, the innovation, we are right now on going through what we call the digital revolution across the whole globe. But when it comes to Africa, I looked at the numbers recently, ITU, which is the International Telecommunication uh, you know, they, they, they've come up with the statistics. So there is currently 2.9 billion people who do not have access to the, to the internet while we're talking about 5G and all these revolutions coming out. So that's one third of the global population that does not have access. When we look into Africa, it's the other way around. It's only one third that have access. Now, I think we've got to think about that. It is called the digital divide. Digital divide means that the technologies and the information that we're trying to push back to the, to, the, to the users does not reach those who need it the most. And I think this is, again, a key message that we've got to keep in our mind. We have to think uh, not only developing the solutions, but we have to see how do we bring the enabling environment. And most importantly, how do we make sure that that information flows to those who need it the most and how can we contribute in bridging the, 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 the digital divide? I would leave it there. I think uh, overall uh, solutions are out there, as we've mentioned, technologies are out there. We know a bit about the, the policy frameworks. And now I think we still have some work to do in the coming years. And I hope that uh, the RCF and, 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 the and the other academic institutions will contribute all together in this, uh, you know, uh, uh, future challenge to bridge in the divide and bring in the technologies to do this on it. So, thank you very much. I'll thank, you, thank you, Dr. Suresh. Dr. Dukali wants to comment. <laughs> well, Dr. Suresh, you said the right thing. We need to have an enabling environment for, for this technology. But the problem we need also to have demand for this technology and demand and use it by, uh, for the farmer. That means that we need to start to think that agriculture to be profitable. That means that people are making money so that they can invest in agriculture and to invest in this new technology. If they are not, if it is not profitable, there will be no demand for these technologies. Not because people, they don't want them because they cannot afford them. Exactly. That's a problem. Definitely, definitely. I think in, uh, enabling it's a key, a key issue that, that has to be taken into account. We have time for two, three questions from from the floor, please. The, the panel were very convincing, enough, I think. So I think that we are on time. It's ah, you, you have a comment. Thank you. 
want to say uh, thank you again, uh, but I think also we need to, one thing is uh, we are here with uh, different uh, background. One most important, uh, we talked about the solution is, uh, for example, bringing green solution in our agriculture. We can listen support to develop what we call the green job in terms of uh, bringing uh, a green solution, renewable agrophotosystem voltaic, uh, agrovoltaic system in agriculture. And uh, what also is important is uh, how we are, trans we are giving to the community those research output. Is, uh, for example, we talk about uh, artificial intelligence. This is what we are doing for climate action. We have now developing a hub uh, for reform, uh, before, you know, we from have uh, more than 100 university. We have also academia. We are developing what we call a, a, a hub of artificial intelligence for climate action. This is something also, we are also part of the initiative of uh, accelerating the impact of uh, climate uh, services to the communities. So that means we cannot work alone. We need here to build what a network. This network, one institution cannot deliver all of those actions at the same moment. We need to have a partnership. And partnership is key for uh, the youth who are now being graduated. They have to expand through this collaboration, the partnership, so we can have more collaboration among institutions and among also each other. This is something I want to let uh, in terms of uh, research, building capacity, and also service delivery we need this strong partnership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the excellent uh, intervention of all the members of the panel. And now I think it's time for the, be, um, before uh, going to the tea break, uh, I, want, I want you to join me to congratulate the panel for the excellent job that they have done. Thank you. Another round of applause, please, from the floor. Thank you very much. We will uh, proceed to our tea break. And uh, we are right on time. So let's come back at uh, 15 minutes to the top of the next hour. <laughs>